Francis Weller, welcome uh, to Shrinkwrap Radio. I should say welcome back. Welcome back to Shrinkwrap Radio. It's really good to see you again, David. I'm glad to be back with you. Yeah, well, it's good to have you on again. And uh, I say welcome back because you were my guest on episode number 279, discussing your book on grief, ritual, and the soul of the world. I guess getting ready for the situation <laughs> that we find ourselves in now, because yeah. you were already wrestling with uh, sort of profound philosophical and spiritual issues that we now find ourselves in. And, and over the 10 years since that podcast uh, interview, you've really stayed on theme, uh, d- deepening your work and, and, and your life and your practice. And out of all of that come your most recent publication, uh, a collection of essays on the absence of the ordinary. And what an appropriate title that is, because the, uh, the ordinary, we were talking a little bit before turning on the microphone here and just reflecting on how the life of children has changed compared to how it was when we grew up relatively wild. So uh, I am so impressed by your writing, by this book, and, and I really wanted people to get, to get a feel for your poetic soul, your poetic style of presenting yourself. And so I'm going to be asking you periodically, I, I've marked some, uh, some passages from your book, and at first I was going to read some of them, but then I thought, well, it'd be so much better to have people experience it in in your voice. And uh, so I'll be cueing you. And I think let's start off with a quote from the introduction of the book. And it's that first quote. Okay, it says, um, we are living in anxious times. Uncertainty has come into our homes and found its way into each of our lives. What was once stable and familiar has been shaken and we have entered a steep descent into the unknown. Here the invisible world asserts its power, reminding us of the folly of control. And these times, they may not be the gods and goddesses affecting our fates, but something equally mysterious, something unseen moving through the air, rattling our deep psychic ground, affecting everything. Fear and anxiety readily appear in times like these. Our work is to turn towards these jittery guests and make a place at the table to offer tea and soup, a warm place to rest. I really like that that last line, and it, it sounds to me like an idea maybe that comes from Rumi, the idea of uh, of welcoming the the guest. Uh, 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 talk to us a bit about that because it's it's hard to think about what we're going through now as a welcome guest, at least on the surface. But you really invite us to uh, to revision it in some ways. Uh, so well, yeah, it's not that it's a welcome guest, but it's an, an inevitable guest right now, mm-hmm. and so we can either resist that presence of the anxiety, the uncertainty, the fear, the dread, or we can begin to turn toward it and begin to find some way of warming it, staying close to it, and finding in it some sense of our communal thread. I mean, that's part of what I think is unraveling right now is the fiction of individualism. Ah. You know, and that it's not my circumstance anymore. Even in my therapy practice, much of what's being referred to isn't personal intra-psychic material anymore. It's uh-huh. it is intra-psychic. It's what's going on in the field. And so, are you afraid right now, David? Yeah, you know, I think there's fear circulating around many. Yeah, people. yeah. I, the, there's fear there. I I I think my defense mechanisms mostly uh, work pretty well for me, so that I. I don't dwell on the fear that much, but uh, but as I mentioned uh, before the interview, I've got 
two sets of grandkids in yeah. right in this area and and so i really fear for them and i and i fear for uh my you know will i be able to hug them again ever i mean i'm yeah. getting up there in years and uh, we don't know when i'll be able to, to you know to hug them and see them in person yeah. so hug. yeah that's that's a fearful part of it and that's that's the part we need to turn toward and have some kind of intimacy with those parts of us that are fearful, that are anxious. I mean, the other thing that's coming to mind for me is that what I'm experiencing is not mine, again, privately, but I am experiencing the ambient feel of the collective experience of felt fear and dread and uncertainty yeah. and grief. I mean, my God, the levels of grief that, that are circulating through the atmosphere right now. We have, you know, well over a quarter million dead now in our country and over two million worldwide and millions and millions of families affected by, you know, un unemployment, loss of jobs, uh, economic fears. The grief levels are really saturating the field too. So we either become skillful at knowing how to navigate that territory or we have to shut down. Yeah, and again, I'm struck by the fact that you have been preparing for this for years. Your your whole practice and work has been around around grief and dealing with grief, and uh, at a time when it wasn't really in our face the way it is now. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and so, how are you finding that? all of the inner work that you've done is serving you during this period in terms of, of having to deal with your own grief and sense of loss and fear and all of that? Well, I think I'm very familiar with the territory. It doesn't mean I don't go through my own experiences of fear. I mean, the other, about a month or so ago, I was <clears throat> heading to bed with a lot of dread in my body, just the heaviness. You know, I think there's upcoming the election and what. Oh the, yeah. The results going to be around the election, and I think that's when the uh, UN report on the global climate catastrophe was coming out, and I'm just feeling this heaviness in my body. And wisely, I turned, maybe synchronistically, towards my bookshelf and pulled on a slender collection of essays by Linda Hogan called Dwellings. And I opened the book to the chapter, All My Relations. Mm -hmm. And I recognized how much my fear and dread had kind of closed me off. And it caused a kind of contraction in my soul, to my spirit, yeah. to my heart. And I was forgetting all of the tendrils of entanglement that I have with the moon and the stars and the and the uh, ravens and the crows and the dug fur and the redwoods outside my home. And so I began to extend my, my tendrils back out there. Yeah. And I began to feel my, my wild entanglement with it all. Huh. And that helped yeah. me to really calm down internally. Yeah. 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 Feel more of my, uh, that I am actually quite immense. Yeah, that's a word that that comes up in in these essays quite a bit. You talk, yeah. you kind of call the reader to become immense. Yes. Yeah. So say a little bit more about that. I think the first time I used that phrase when I was working at the uh, cancer help program um, down at Bolinas, which I helped to co-facilitate with Michael Lerner a couple times a year. And I'm, as I'm sitting with these people facing these dreadful uh, diagnoses at times, and how much our psychological conditioning is, is geared towards positivism. Yeah. You know, stay hopeful, keep positive, you know, stay loving. And that's fine. But what about all those parts of me that are dreading, that are fearful that are, you know, 
aware of the presence of death and disappearance and endings and suffering, I think what we're being asked to do is get our arms around both of these presences. Mm -hmm. And that I would say to them, you know. And that's immense. Yeah, that is immense. Our immensity. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot to. Uh... As James Hillman would once said, you know, the issue is rarely about resolution. It's about spaciousness. How big can we get? Uh -huh. How much can we include in our encounter with our own humanness? And this is certainly part of our humanness, right? Fear and yeah. grief and death and yeah. suffering. My God. But our, 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 our psychology is so heroic and so right. bent towards positivism. And, yeah, you know, particularly in, in America. Because we, we have listeners all over the world here. But yes, yeah, yes, particularly yes. how the... I think the other, the rest of the world has seen that in us sometimes more clearly than we can see it in ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, I'd like to move you on to your next uh, quote, um, which is, you see it there, right? Yeah, there are shifts happening along the fault lines of this evolving crisis. The insane pace of modernity is being brought to a screeching halt. The dominant ideology of power and privilege is cracking, coaxing a more compassionate and heartfelt response to our mutually entangled lives. Suddenly, productivity is not the primary value, but connection, affection, love, encouragement. In the pause of sheltering in place, we remember neighbors and kindness, mutuality and empathy, so now what? How do we get navigate this tidal surge of uncertainty? How do we engage the world in the absence of the ordinary? And those, of course, are the key questions, you know. Um, so now what? <laughs> As you say here, how do we navigate this tidal surge of uncertainty? And uh, I, I liked earlier, too, where you said the dominant ideology of power and privilege is cracking, is coaxing a more compassionate and heartfelt response to our mutually entangled lives. So there again, you bring up the idea that although we may not be physically present with one another, we are connected in multiple ways. Yes. I mean, I see this really as a time of endings. That's... Uh... It's the, again the ending the fiction of individualism, ending the ending the fiction of supremacy of all kinds, whether it's supremacy over nature or supremacy over other races or other genders. These fictions are being radically challenged by the circumstances we're facing um, because none of them actually have any solidity to them. They're built on, well, if we really went into this deeply, we'd go back into the whole experience of individualism leading to a profound sense of emptiness at the core of our being. Mm -hmm. And particularly in white Western culture. What, and how have we attempted to co compensate for that emptiness? Well, through consumption, through uh, control, through domination, through privilege, through power, uh, through rank. And you know, all these are strategies to cope with this feeling of emptiness. But none of that, they're all hollow. Yeah. Built, up, built upon a, a true sense of emptiness. And so, what we have to do actually is courageously turn and face our own emptiness. Our own, we was at some point along our, our cultural trajectory uh, out of European countries, we lost the connective tissue to our ancestry, to ritual, to story, to land, to food. Um, to landscape, all of these things kind of got cut off. And we have become what Stephen Jenkinson calls an orphaned people. And we don't know how to deal with that. There's tremendous grief that we would have to acknowledge. An orphanage people? An orphaned people. An, an orphan people? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, That's a huge topic. And, and so there's... At the same time, there's a, an opportunity in this as well, right? Because with the 
with the death, uh, you know, you said a lot is coming to an end. And when you say that, I feel it in my body. I mean, I, there's a resistance that comes up, you know, no, 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 I don't want it. I don't want it all to end. Um, but there's a real opportunity to, and this maybe sounds like American optimism again, you know, it's hard to get rid of it all together. An opportunity to uh, to reinvent ourselves, to rise to the challenge, et cetera. If, if we can really be willing to not grasp for answers too soon. Mm -hmm. You know, we're big on solutions, but I think our solutions are oftentimes predicated on the same premises that got us into the trouble in the first place. Yeah. That's why these endings, I think, are so essential. This is a time, I, I'm, I'm saying we're all, I often call it, we're entering a period of the long dark, which may mm. last decades or generations. I don't know how long this is going to last. Right, right. This is, this is not a time of optimism, of, you know, um, rising up and success. This is a time of descent. And this is the, this is the direction of soul. As you know, from all of your work and all of your conversations, that soul leads us downward. Yes. Into the depths where we deal with vulnerability and death and intimacy and our entanglements with the world and with one another. This is a holy ground. And it leads us into darkness. And that scares the crap out of us. Right. <laughs> we, are, we are very much an ascension culture. We like the light. We like things bright and shining so like we know where we are standing. But we're being led into the darkness, into a very shadowed territory where we're much more closer to being on our knees and kind of brailing our way through our next steps rather than certainty and control. We may have to give up all of those fictions. What was the word you just used? We are what on our way? Brailing, it sounds like. Brailing, yeah, like braille, like reading. Like reading braille, like having to feel your way yeah. along the trail. Yeah. Yeah. On hands and knees, okay. On hands and knees. It's a very humble time. Yeah. So we can be maybe redreamt by the earth. Yeah. Again, it's it, it, it's hard to accept, you know, when you say we're entering a long darkness. I think we're, some of us are, are rallying right now in, in very positive ways. Yes. And, um, but a long darkness, a long challenge, that could be a whole different different thing. I think that's part of our ripening as human beings right now is, is to face the reality of what we're hearing. I mean, we, we might be able to make some major alterations in our racist history. I'm praying for that. I'm yeah. doing whatever I can for that. We might be able to make some, some real progress around our economic disparities. Where we're going to hit the road most concretely is in climate change yeah this, this one is going to affect every human being on the planet that's the that's the one that we are really having to brace for and to develop our own internal resiliencies and our communal resiliencies so that's that's soul work as far as i'm concerned yeah, yeah. how do we deal with difference how do we deal with conflict how do we deal with you know conflicting needs how do we deal with building in the old, the old ideology, in the old indigenous tradition, the cosmos was built on community first, family second, and the individual last. That was the cosmology. We have inverted that entirely in white Western mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. Individual first, family second, and community is kind of an abstract rhetoric. So we have to begin to reimagine this again. We have to begin to reimagine what would a, a thriving local community look like? Because if that community is thriving, I will be okay. It's no longer survival of the, of the singular. It's no longer about private salvation. It's no longer about looking after number one. Again, those are all fictions that are decaying and dying. And it, it, there's only one way through and that way, you know, is, is this th there's only one way through and that is together. I, you know, I grew up, I think I, I'm a loner. I have to, I have been a loner quite a bit in my life uh, with a, 
hanging tight with a very small group of friends. And so that will require a big adjustment on my part, I think. And, and I, we're no longer, you know, I grew up on move, move, cowboy movies and, <laughs> and James Bond movies and things like that, where there was a, a, a strong, mostly solitary hero that come in and kind of rescue the situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that myth is uh, inappropriate right now. I think so. Yeah. I, think it was, I think it was Thich Nhat Hanh who said that the next Buddha would not come as an individual, but as a community. Wow. And I think the next healers, I think the next culture shapers, they're not going to be so much individuals, but communal, communal mm -hmm. gatherings. I mean, we will shape things together. Yeah, yeah. And I, I want to I honor your, your introverted nature. I am an introvert too. I love my solitude. I need it. But I can also feel, it's what I call the, um, the double helix, the twining trail of the soul. The soul has a simultaneous need for sovereignty and intimacy, for a deep interior life and a communal life, simultaneously. Now, every one of us will have a, a lean towards one or the other. You know, I definitely yeah. work more towards that sovereignty piece of my own my own solitude. It's where I do my writing, my thinking, my, my work is very private with people. Um, but I've also had to learn how to do more community building and to bring those values into community. So it's, I think we'll be all, all be asked to do both. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe I should ask you to give us some sense of what you mean by soul. You know, it's, for me, it's kind of like Louis Armstrong's thing. Uh, you know, <clears throat> you can't define it, but you know it. You you feel it in your body. But um, uh, when you say soul, you know, because I, I came up in a fundamentalist Christian uh, cosmology th uh, that I no longer subscribe to. Uh, so you're not necessarily, when you say soul, you're not necessarily talking about uh, a personality that exists after death. Or are you? That's kind of beyond my pay grade. But uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is that uh, I'm not talking about a metaphysical idea of soul, but a deeply, well, it's both deeply intimate, deeply personal. It's my most interior experience of being kind of separate, somewhat separate than my sense of self. Um, it has a deeper foundation, a more archaic root system, I would say, that, that tangles down into the commons of the, of the human experience. The commons of the soul would be grief and loss and death and vulnerability, tenderness, friendship, love, longing, beauty, imagination. These are the ingredients that go into the geography of soul. Okay. But it's, a, it's kind of the... Um, integral twin to the ascension rising spirit and the dissension oriented soul. Soul takes us down into the earth. Spirit tends to rise us up to the mountaintops. So we have the difference between Handel's Messiah singing Alleluia, the great Alleluia, so celestial, so uprising. Then we have Leonard Cohen singing Alleluia. Yeah. Same words, very different feeling tone. Right. Dropped and dropped in, you know, that's the broken hallelujah, he calls yeah. it. Yeah. That's soul. It takes us into our bodies, into the grit of life, into the messiness of life. Spirit tends to like clarity and vision and um, uh, far off seeing, where a soul likes things close in. And very I, love, I love his line, uh, there's a crack in everything, that's and that's right. how the light gets in. What a beautiful yeah. one-liner. Yeah. His soul has no problems with our mistakes, with our uh, failings. It uses everything in our life as the, as the core material, as an alchemy would say, it's the prima materia. It's yeah. the stuff of life, and it's what it works with. So it doesn't care about our histories, if we've been, you know, 
you know, abandoned or hurt or that's just the material of life. And it was right. all. To right. Yeah. 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 You've got another quote here that starts uh, with a powerful uh, assertion. Social distance is a cold term. Give us yeah. that quote, if you will. Yeah, social distance is a cold term, lacking any sense of the rich invitation that awaits us when we turn toward our internal worlds. Solitude is a state of hospitality, a welcoming of all that is in need of attention. Yeah, and that's what you were just talking about was uh, the importance of solitude. And solitude, talk to us about solitude and loneliness. There's a lot of, a lot of loneliness out there right now. Yeah, solitude, uh, solitude is, or there's a line of Rilke's, Marie Rilke, where he said, I am too alone in the world, but not alone enough to make every moment holy. Now there's the two, there's oh, isolation, okay. I'm too alone in the world. Yeah. I'm cut off from everything. I'm separate, segregated, in a sense, in solitary confinement. But then he makes this luscious pivot but not alone enough to make every moment holy. That's solitude. In my solitude, we have the chance of really dropping into the depth of our being. And as Jung would say, the depth of our being is everything. We, we find our kinship with all things in the depths of our being. So, so we have a bit of a choice here, right? To either go into our fear and panic about being alone, cut off from other people, right. or to use it as, an, as a soul-building opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I want to have, again, great empathy and compassion for extroverts. Uh, some of my people I'm working with in my practice are extroverts, and this is really stressing the hell out of them. Really yeah, I, I, I wonder, yeah, yeah, I thought about that and wondered, you know, if that's yeah. true. Yeah, for, and for me, you know, and probably for you, it's 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 stressful. But I'm very comfortable being in my home, uh -huh. being, being alone with my wife, and you know, just in this little cocoon of a space. But for some others, it's really quite difficult to hold that space. So it does become kind of a an interior soul practice. Can I keep turning toward the parts of me that are that are uncomfortable, that are frightened, that mm -hmm. are feeling lonely. I remember I, I shared in my, my book on grief, uh, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, a story of a, a woman I was working with. And uh, she came in one day, she said, I just hate going home at night. She was going through a very ugly divorce. She said, I just hate going home at night. I, I said, why is that? She said, well, when I get there, it's cold, it's dark, it's empty, it's lonely. It's, it's you know, I hate it. And I said, well, can you imagine it as the holiest time of day? That when you open the door, you're meeting your most vulnerable self, the part of you that feels lonely, that feels cold. And can you speak to this part of you? Can you say, let's turn on the tea, let's light the fire, let's make some places of warmth for us. Can you be a place of welcoming to this part of you? And that's when I remember that, that quote of Rilke's about making that Pivot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can this become a time of holiness, of solitude, of you know, deep soul work? You also talk a lot about initiation, and I know that you've led initiation rituals over the years, and you're kind of known in this Sonoma County uh, for that work. Um, and uh, you suggest that we're being called to an initiation, and you say it's a rough initiation. Uh, what can you tell us about rough initiations? Is there any other kind? <laughs> well, yes, there are. Um, <laughs> there, are, like, let's see, a traditional initiation that would be held in an intact village community, tribal community, is what I call a contained encounter with death. And the containment is provided by the community, by the elders, by the ritual, by the ancestors, by the land, by the space and time is set apart 
from the community, that all provides a profound containment field for this unraveling of our psychic lives. Yeah, and, and also the fact that it's embedded in a tradition. It's something that that we have done for millennia, exactly. our people. Yes, and so you but, see- But that we, that. we don't quite have that built into yeah. our culture. No, we have almost none of that. Yeah. Now there, so again, this rough initiation idea came out of the cancer help program because I began looking at their experience and seeing the, the parallels between what was happening to them and what happens in traditional initiation. There are three things that typically happen. There's a severance from the world that you once knew. Mm -hmm. So the initiate is taken out of his or her or their family setting and they're, they're escorted outside the village. You get a phone call one day and say, or you're going into your, see your doctor and they say, it's positive. You have breast cancer, you have a glioblastoma, you've got you know, liver cancer, or you've left the world that you've been in. Up until that moment, you were a, cert a certain person. Yeah. And that, that world is shattered in that moment, which leads to the second thing that happens in initiation. There's a radical alteration in your sense of identity. Who I was is no more. I've heard, I can't tell you how many times at the cancer program, I don't know who I am anymore. And of course we hear that in therapy. We hear that we've probably have felt that in our own lives from time to time when things unravel. And the third thing is there's a, there's a sense that we could never return to the world that was. Hmm. And in initiation, you don't want to return to the world that was. That's one of, again, one of the fallacies in Western medicine and Western psychology will get you back to where you were before the fill in the blank mm -hmm. so that would be wasting a perfectly good cancer heart attack depression you know or now global crisis we don't want to go back to where we were this is an invitation for some type of new revelation of how we have to maybe it's an old revelation of how we have to once again re re return to and restore our relationships to one another and to the to the land base to our watersheds we can't continue to do this anymore. What's the third the third word that you used? To, you, you had a word for the first and the second and what stage three of initiation? Now, there's a profound sense you can never return to the world that was. Oh, that is, okay, that is it. Yeah, yeah, so it's radical severance, alteration of identity, and there is no return. And therefore, you have to be born again in some way. We have to undertake the ordeal as an obligation, as a kind of a, how should I say it? This is the opportunity right now that we're facing towards a, a collective movement towards maturation. We have been living, particularly in white Western culture, in a very adolescent fashion. What can I get? What's in it for me? Even our psychology is about self-improvement. You know, it's about me. Initiation, as far as I've ever studied it, was never about the individual. It was always a ripening of the indi individual for the sake thereof. You were prepared to become someone who could caretake and help sustain the village, the watershed, mm -hmm. the, the animal life, the food sources you were being prepared to take your place as a member of a functioning community. Yeah, yeah. You've got a, a great quote uh, around that, uh, the next quote here. Which, how we respond? Uh, the immediate need of our time. Oh, where's that one? I don't know if I skipped something or not. Well, I could read that one. <laughs> Why don't you read that one? Okay. The immediate need of our time is ripened and seasoned, is for ripened and seasoned adult human beings to take their place in our communities. Individuals who carry a deep and abiding fidelity to the living body of this benevolent earth, to beauty and to their own souls. Traditionally, these were the ones who had successfully crossed 
a series of initiatory thresholds, and had come through as protectors and carriers of the communal soul. They were the ones whose artistry and wisdom kept the current culture alive. We live in a society that has all but abandoned rituals of initiation. Consequently, we are languishing from the absence of mature and robust adults. Amen. That's, that says it very powerfully. And does that yeah. mean that, yeah, are we all called to be mature and robust adults? Or is it, or are there certain people who are called to that because they're more equipped to, to uh, go to that stage? I, I did a series of talks called The Alchemy of Initiation. And it began with a premise that initiation is not optional. So I think every human being is called to this threshold. Uh -huh. And I begin with a few other premises, you know, that life itself, even in the absence of, in, of traditional initiations, will find ways to take you to the edge of your own ripening. But the third premise is you can still miss the bus. Yeah. There is no guarantee. Right, even no guarantees. Given, even if you've been given all of the ingredients, like trauma and uh, suffering and wounds and you know losses and failure those are all ripening conditions for maturation but you can still remain adolescent in your in your response to it mm -hmm. we've certainly seen this in our political arena of late where we know that certain characters in this drama have had very difficult childhoods but did they use the material to ripen or did they use it to develop a strategic life of maintaining domination and control. So there's no guarantee that you're going to break through to the other side and become a ripened adult. But the invitation's always gonna be there. Yeah. I believe this, everyone. This also puts me in mind of a, a previous interview uh, <clears throat> with a, um, a guy with a background in, in divinity, in, both in psychology and divinity, uh, John Robinson, who has written about the call to, to elders, to those of us who've got gray hair and so on, that this is an opportunity for us to step forward and, and uh, provide some leadership. Not just an opportunity, but a responsibility, as you say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so. And I think the elders are shaped in the fires of, of loss and grief. Yeah, you know, and how courageous can we be to keep our face turned into those winds right now, and again to be broken open to our deep entanglement with the wider world, rather than again my own self-preservation. But how do I show up in a robust manner right now for the needs of the of the youth? Yeah, so you know you. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I say they're looking for us. Yeah. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, you've got a, a, um, one of your essays is titled An, Appreciation, An Apprenticeship with Sorrow. And I didn't know about your cancer work until I read your bio. And uh, so I didn't know that you were doing that. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, so it strikes me that doing that cancer work must be an apprenticeship with sorrow. I mean, that you sort of deliberately walked into that painful place to, with people to do that. What, what can you tell us about that work and how it's affected you, maybe changed you? Um, it's ironic because... Uh, well, I should say that the most obvious thing that happens when you're sitting in a group of people who are dealing with a life-threatening diagnosis is that they are no longer in denial about all of us having a life-threatening diagnosis. We're all terminal. So there's, there's, it becomes foreground rather than background. Yeah. And what happens when it becomes foreground is there's a certain um, distillation of vision 
you begin to look at things more immediately for what has to happen now. And it's ironic that lots of our conversations in our group time together when I'm leading the group process isn't so much about cancer, but about the unlived life, about the times of self-abandonment, self-betrayal, the dreams that got neglected and parts of us that have been pushed to the margins of our life, you know, our, our sadness or our, our losses, or they come much more acutely into the foreground of our life. Uh, so they're being asked to really, again, practice that immensity to begin to welcome everything. So we often begin our sessions by saying, what's present right now? What is wanting your attention? It's frequently grief, fear, loneliness, uh, uh, some abandoned story, some old memory. These things come crashing to the foreground now, mm -hmm. asking for some acknowledgement. You know, but I would just say the apprenticeship idea, David, is a little different. The apprenticeship is the idea that every single day in every one of our lives, we will witness some thread of grief. You know, every one of us walking down the streets, looking into each other's eyes, no one is immune to loss. No one is immune to suffering. And right now we're also beginning to become aware of more and more day by day of the greater, wider threads of loss to species, to, you know, ecosystems, to glaciers. There was a catastrophe yesterday, was it in uh, China, Tibet, I think, or uh, India, where a, a glacier broke and a flood of water just drowned 200 people. So again, these symptoms are not over there. They are in my body too. I remember when they, in, in 2010, when the uh, oil spill happened in the Gulf, I would wake up at night hearing the cries of dolphins mm. and of shorebirds 2,000 miles away. I heard them and I would weep in the middle of the night for my kin. Now, I think that's also part of our maturation. This apprenticeship in the old language of apprenticeship, you would take on a long study with a weaver, a painter, a, a farrier, um, a stonemason. And over that time, you would end up be called a, a master in that craft. In the soul apprenticeship with sorrow, the prolonged apprenticeship with grief doesn't lead to mastery, it leads to elderhood. That is the making of the elder. Mm -hmm. Someone who has undertaken this long apprenticeship and has had a fidelity to that for that long stretch, uh, stretch of time, you are ripened by that relationship. You are deepened by it. It's like you're carved out like a riverbed and deepened by that apprenticeship so that you can hold much and you can turn your again, you can be a presence for those who are suffering in our, in our community. Yeah. I guess that's why some black and white photos of people with very wrinkled and cracked faces, uh, but they bring forth, you, you see the, the kind of the way that their face has eroded through the, the trials and conditions of their life. Yeah. Yeah. I think the word character actually comes from the, uh, the way that water can make etchings on stone. Uh -huh. so, so our character shows on our on our skin. You know, we're weathered. Yeah, we are weathered. Yeah, by time. You know? Yeah, but this apprenticeship is a uh, recognizes again that we will not be immune from suffering, and that it it is something we must undertake. You know, because the sorrows of the world is. Our own, our own personal losses around our parts of ourselves that have been shamed and denied and our, the losses of those that we love, our homes, our, we just, our, our beloved cat just died two weeks mm -hmm. ago and we're just still missing her terribly. Oh, wow, well, yeah. And every day we look for her little you know, presence in the house. She's gone. Yeah, yeah. You know, 
we're always being touched by grief. And there's the ancestral grief that we are really having to ne ne to negotiate now around yeah. racism and slavery and genocide to native cultures. And I mean, that's why we have to take up the apprenticeship because grief is around us all the time. Uh -huh. And we either, we either undertake that disciplined approach to it or again, the heart has to shut down. There's a quote here that I'll read that uh, says what you're saying. It, it, you know, you don't really need to be quoted because you express all of this so well just in speaking. Uh, you write, grief and loss touch us all. Arriving at our door in many ways, it comes swirling on the winds of divorce, the death of someone dear, an illness that alters the course of our life. For many of us, grief is intimately, uh, is intimately, I must say, is tied intimately to the ravages we witness daily to watersheds and forests, to the extinction of species, the collapse of democracy, and the fading of civilization. Left unattended, these sorrows can seep underground, darkening our days. It is our unexpressed sorrows the congested stories of loss that when left untouched block our access to the vitality of the soul. To be able to freely move in and out of the soul's inner chambers, we must first clear the way. This requires finding meaningful ways to speak of sorrow. It requires that we wake up an apprenticeship with sorrow. Learning to welcome, hold, and metabolize sorrow is the work of a lifetime. Our apprenticeship begins when we come to understand that grief is ever-present in our lives. This is a difficult realization, but one that has the opportunity of opening our heart to a deeper love for our singular life and for the windswept world of which we are a part. We begin with a simple gesture of picking up the shards of grief that lie littered on the floor of our house. Nothing special, nothing heroic, not unlike the young novices entering their apprenticeship with the master teacher who began humbly sweeping the shavings, mixing the pigments, cleaning the brushes, tending the fires. We begin the process by building our capacity to hold sorrow in the womb of the heart. Through this patience, we become able to welcome the pervasive and encompassing presence of grief. So beautifully written, so, so very poetic and touching. Thank you, David. Really. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And it really, it, you were saying it in other words, but it really uh, captures what you were saying, what we were just discussing. and and just wraps it in a beautiful bundle. It's not the easiest spiritual work to do, but it is the most necessary, I think, right now. Yeah. I often talk about it in terms of soul activism. You know, uh, I tell the story of driving up north on 101, or okay, maybe, maybe it was one, and coming across a clear cut and yeah. my, whole, my whole body, and I'm sure you've had that experience. Our whole body reacts to that. Yeah. Some violation has occurred here. Yeah. I've seen uh, uh, video of flight over our old redwood forests where the people who are in cars, they see on either side yep. lovely forest. Yep. But from the air, you see all this land that is just stripped bare. Oh, that's yep. so painful. That's so painful. Now, yeah. that's, that's our obligation to, to register that. We yeah. are, I think, as human beings, we are the receptor sites for the sorrows of the world. Mm. And if we are, if our hearts are closed because of overwhelm or numbing or, you know, uh, forgetfulness, and we do not take up this apprenticeship, who's going to register these rips and tears in the bodies of the world? That's our moral and spiritual obligation, I think, right now. Mm -hmm. To be the mouthpiece 
for the sorrel, for the ferns, for the mushroom, for the, you know, for the trees, for the owls, for all those beings who cannot protest. See, grief is not just an emotion, but it's a mm -hmm. core human faculty. And one of the core faculties of that grief is protest, is to say enough is enough is enough. And to put our bodies on the line and say, this cannot happen any longer. Yeah. Grief, grief is, a, is a confirmation or a, an indication of affinity. I grieve for the suffering of what I love, of what is partly who I am. See, we live with that fiction again, back to individualism, that that's not me. That that's just a forest over there and I'm in my own mm -hmm. encapsulated yeah. isolation. But how can I possibly? I'm breathing what they're exuding. I am their breath. You know, I am the trees, you know, express, I, I am the continuation of the trees exhalation. Yeah. You know, so we are completely. And also every, uh, all, all other human beings. Yes. We're having this exchange yeah. of uh, gases, of breathing. So grief and the apprenticeship are really about that deep soul obligation. That's that soul activism to register what is happening to our world and to begin to do whatever we can to preserve, which ties us back in, if I can, one more thought to the initiation. Yeah. That initiation, again, was never meant for the individual. It was meant for the sake of the community. So you see in tribal cultures that are still intact, when an oil company or a fracking company comes in to begin to destroy their land base, it is an assault to their own being they're not doing it out of moral obligation. Like we should protect this land. You're, attack, you're attacking us. The land and the people through initiation are fused. This is my body that you're assaulting. Now that kind of deep connective tissue that comes out of that no. ritual practice is something that we have to begin to reimagine again. You know, so that we can begin to feel that we are part of this not again, that's not because we should, but because our heart beat and the earth beat are the same. That's such a good uh, wrap up that I think maybe, you know, I've got more quotes and all that we could discuss, but I think you've just really kind of given us a good condensation of, uh, of what's in this, uh, this wonderful collection uh, that you've written and uh, I'm going to recommend it highly to people. It's what under a, under a hundred pages, I think, and and yet it's um, it is under a hundred pages, right? Yeah, right now, it's it's just printed out about eight and a half by eleven. It's a PDF. It will be put into a book form soon, but right now it's just a uh, an ebook, and it will be published soon. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just wonderful. So, uh, Francis, I want to uh, I want to thank you for being my guest again on Shrink Wrap Radio. And one part of me was wants to say I wish it was under better circumstances. Another part says this is the appropriate thing for us to be doing right now, and I'm glad that I have the opportunity to do it with you. These are our circumstances, and hopefully, you know, through what you're doing and what we're doing, um, it will embolden people to engage what is happening right now at the depths of what is being asked of us. So thank you so much for having me be part of your program.